Hello, 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 Filter Free America listeners. We are back together again, uh, and it feels uh, so wonderful. Uh, you, you're prepared to listen to the show. I'm sure all of you have your, uh, your ear canals uh, freshly cleaned out. So you can, uh, you know, hear the uh, Filter Free America podcast without any waxy interruptions. Uh, some of you maybe went to a professional to have it done. Some of you have maybe violated the rules of Q-tips. Anybody knows the rules of Q-tips? You're not supposed to stick them in your ears, but we all do it anyway. And you probably did that, you know, and at a r- great risk to yourself, a great risk of personal harm to your eardrums. You you threw caution into the wind, and you jabbed that that little stick, little paper ish cardboard stick with a little m of cute of cotton on the top. You jabbed it ever so gently into your ear and swabbed it around, removing all the wax that would restrict uh, your ability to hear my voice. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that so much, and I'm glad. Glad you do it. I'm glad you do it. Um, let's talk about the show. Let's talk about the episode here. Uh, another, and I, you know, I'm kind of getting to the point where I have to stop saying it, you know, because I, I've, I've, uh, I was getting ready to tell you this is another powerful episode. But you know what? We've had a lot of them as of late. We've had a lot of, of uh, uh, stories of, of, of uh, tragedy, stories of of uh, sorrow, all kinds of things, uh, very emotional, emotion uh, uh, building, releasing type topics uh, that really stir you up on the inside, make you think, bring a little bit of a tear to, you eye, to your eye. Uh, you have a lot of those. And for some reason, I'm getting these episodes, I'm getting opportunities for these people to cross my path and agree to speak with me. And uh, I'm tremendously grateful but I got to stop being surprised about it. I guess it's just going to keep happening. I don't know. But this is another perfect example of a, of a fantastic episode that I am truly honored to be able to share with you. Uh, it's a very personal story from our guest. And uh, our guest, he uh, he didn't hold back at all. Oh, excuse me. A little bit of burp there. Uh, he, he, did not hurt, he did not hold back at all. Uh, he wanted to tell his story. You know, I, you know, I always got to do like a little pre conversation with the guests just to, you know, clarify what all I can ask, you know, and how open they're going to be, get all that. He's like, dude, just ask whatever you want to ask. I'm going to be completely open and I want to talk about it. All right. So let me talk about what the guest is or who the guest is and uh, what we're going to talk about. Uh, the guest uh, his gen- is a gentleman. His name is uh, John Joel. John Joel. Probably not somebody that you're going to know. Uh, not not known for being famous or anything like that, uh, but what uh, John uh, is here to talk to us about is he is a recovering heroin addict. Recovering heroin addict, that's right. He's been uh, clean so uh, for two point five years now, two and a half years, and uh, basically he, uh, I think from a from a dental surgery procedure, he was prescribed uh, opioids. Uh, pain pills, and uh, he rapidly became addicted to pain pills, uh, so much so that he was no longer just eating them. Uh, He started breaking them down and shooting them into his arm with a needle. That's right. And in two months after the original, you know, uh, addiction, I guess, or the original time where he got these pills... Ah, uh, he he started going to heroin. Uh, he'll explain in the uh, in the interview. Uh, obviously, it was cheaper. Couldn't afford the pills anymore, so he started dabbling in heroin. And of course, he was shooting that into his arm as well, too. Well, I assume his arm, but wherever he was shooting it, he was shooting it into his body with a needle. Yeah. So he again tells me everything in this conversation, and you will hear. Uh, part of his addiction story is he was homeless uh, for two years. And uh, I probably should point out, it's right here in the uh, uh, the Twin Cities, the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. And for those who, who don't know or are unaware, or you're listening somewhere warm in the world, it gets really, really cold uh, here in the Twin Cities uh, in the wintertime. And 
He lived as a homeless heroin addict in the Twin Cities for over two years, uh, living in abandoned homes and things like that that he'll tell you about. And this is an amazing story. It's a, it's a tragic story, but it's one that you're going to be hanging on to every word as he goes through his, um, you know, his experience as a heroin addict. Uh, talks, uh, you know, about experiences with uh, other heroin addicts, uh, other homeless heroin addicts. We talk about the culture of that, you know, and uh, it's, it's uh, a shocking amount of uh, homeless drug addicts uh, and just in our little Twin Cities area here. Uh, but we talk about that. We talk about, um, you know, just overall survivability of how he survived uh, as this addict, you know, being homeless. We talk about crimes he committed uh, to get uh, money for more heroin. So lots of interesting stuff there as well, too. Uh, and of course, we, uh, we, we start talking about his recovery. Uh, he's uh, been sober, like I said, uh, for two and a half years now. So we talk about uh, what drove him to recovery. Um, we talk about some relapses that he had. Uh, and then finally how he has uh, reached a, a stability in his, uh, in his recovery uh, to help him get to where he is now with the two and a half years uh, sober. So yes, this is a, if you're not aware of, uh, you know, the, the, um, uh, destructive ability of, of drugs, opioid drugs, heroin, things of that nature, this is going to give you a healthy heaping spoonful of <laughs> reasons why you do not want to do heroin or become addicted to pills or anything else like that. This is, um, yeah, this is, uh, it's going to be some cringy moments. It's going to be some uh, emotional moments. He he had a couple emotional moments within the recording that, you know, we just had to pause for a minute and let that emotion, you know, process. So uh, you're going to get a lot out of this uh, this episode. It uh, starts out sad, gets really bad, and then it ends on a pretty positive note. So, uh, yeah, you, I'm, I'm, we're going to take you through the, uh, through the uh, range of emotions on this one. Uh, real fast, let me thank the uh, sponsor of the Filter Free America podcast. That is simplewebsite.us. 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 And if you're a regular listener, of course, you know this, but for the, all the new folks that just joined us today, Simple Website, what they do is their business model is they help people like you and me build websites using the Squarespace website builder, right? Now, bear with me. I know immediately some of people always think, well, wait a minute. Squarespace is designed for me to do it all on my own. And that is true. Okay. It's true for most people. But using myself as, a, as an example, uh, not everyone can figure it out or at least figure it out fast enough to get it done when they need it done. Right. That was me. So what I did was I talked to the good folks over there at simplewebsite.us I told them, hey, look, I got lots of things to do. I got lots of stuff to do. I really don't have anything to do. I'm just lazy, but whatever. I told them I needed them to build me a website. They just said, sure, uh, give us a list of what you want. We'll throw it together for you, and uh, you'll be happy. And, uh, and it was true. It was. If you'd like to see uh, an example, please go to the Filter Free America website. That's uh, filterfreeamerica.com. Filter Free America. America intentionally misspelled with the letter K.com. And you will see the website that they build and maintain for me. Matter of fact, that's a reminder. I need to send them some notes about some things I want to change and uh, a couple things I need to to fix that I've got uh, kind of jacked up on there right now. But they're going to do it for me. I don't got to worry about it. It's all on them. Simplewebsite.us. But don't don't just go to them if if you want somebody to do it on your own or, or you want somebody to do it completely for you. That's fine. They'll do that. But maybe you're somebody who just wants a little bit of help, right? Just a little bit of help. They'll do that for you too. And also, if you go to their website, simplewebsite.us, you will find lots of free tips and tricks to help you do it on your own if you choose to do it on your own. So there you go, simplewebsite.us. All right, anything else? Uh, oh, yeah, let me make sure you're you're uh, subscribing to the podcast if you're listening to this for the first time. Uh, even if you're not listening to it the first time, make sure you're subscribed at your favorite listening outlet, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio. YouTube, any of that stuff. We're all those places, but please make sure you subscribe. Please make sure you leave a five-star rating or thumbs up or whatever kind of rating system they have. And if you have the ability uh, in the time, please leave a, a nice little um, review for the podcast. All right? That'd be nice. 
Appreciate that. Um, all right, let's kick off this episode, and of course, we got to have a name for it. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pussyfoot around with the name of this one, right? The name I've come up with for this episode is "My Heroin Addiction Story" with John Jewell. Right? That just cuts right to the meat of the whole episode, right there. Okay. All right. So you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Uh, here is my heroin addiction story with John Jewell, right here on the Filter Free America podcast. Let's go. All right. First, tell me where you were, how you did it, under what conditions, when was the first time you uh, remember taking a, an opioid drug in your life? The first time I uh, ever took an, an opioid, uh, I believe it was for tooth pain. Um, and I, yeah, I remember, <clears throat> I remember the feeling. I remember that, uh, um, I didn't feel anxious. I felt very sure of myself. I felt like everything I said was cool, smart or funny. And it, try, yeah. Try, try to watch your fidgeting on the, on the hands. I'm sorry. And, uh, yeah, it just, I mean, it felt great. Okay. Uh, was it scary at all to you? Was it was it like was it euphoria? Was it you e euphoria is a great word for it. Okay. Absolutely it was euphoria. No fear of anything at all. Okay. At, after that, you know, you, you say it was for for like a dental issue. Um did you, I assume you went through the prescription. Did you go through the, was it going through the prescription at a normal pace, like taking it for pain or was there an immediate need to like, oh no, let's take one or two of these or um no, that uh that came a little later. Um, but when that happened, yeah, it uh it got out of control very fast. Opiates are any anybody who who knows anything about opiates understands that they are incredibly powerful. I heard somewhere that if you have opiates in your system for 72 hours without your system clearing out, you're already physically addicted. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it goes from zero to 100 pretty pretty quick. Okay. Um, after that first prescription that you had, did you immediately, I had a, a craving for them, I'm assuming, right? I can't remember. Honestly, that was, I mean, it was so long ago. Um, the the craving and stuff started um, later. And yes, it was going, you know, going through the prescription too fast, reaching out to people to see if they had any, um, spending every dime you had on them. And uh, not not long after that, uh, heroin and then homelessness. Okay. Where were you, what were your sources when you were like, uh, when you're, you know, purchasing them illegally or did you quickly find a, a dealer who dealt in this stuff or was it like you said, you know, contacting friends? Hey, do you got anything left on that prescription? It's Started out contacting friends. Um, then I was, uh, introduced to the, uh, pill community. Okay. Um, and from there, you know, there was just, I mean, it was it was an all day thing with the people, you know, people calling you to see if you had any, calling them to see if they had any, um, and then from there, um, I had a friend one day that said, "Hey, man, that's too much money to spend on pills. Why don't you try this?" Okay. And that was heroin, and um, off and running from there. Okay. Now, in our pre conversation, we talked that uh, you started, you know, break. I don't I don't know how what the, how you describe the process, but the you were actually shooting, yep, uh, using a needle, yep, breaking down the pills and injecting those. Yep. Uh, I, I assume you just you started out by just taking it orally. Yes. What was that? What was the point of transition? When did you say, "Hey, let me try this," or did somebody suggest that to you? Or what was the? Yeah, just uh, you know, one of the friends that I knew at that time was doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I said, "Hey, you don't let me try that." And okay. that's all that happened. One of the biggest mistakes I've ever made in my life, looking back, for sure. So it was just. 
ob- observing him. Yep. Not like a pressure thing. Yep. Say. No, 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 no. He was actually trying to hide it from me. And oh, I was like, okay. what are you, do- you know, what are you doing? And then. To, to give uh, somebody who has no clue, you know, what, addiction or, or specifically, you know, shooting drugs into your veins. Is there, can you verbalize the difference of, of, you know, popping a pill versus shooting it into your arm? Yeah. When you, when, if, if you pop a pill, um, you know, it travels down your throat and then into your stomach and then your stomach gas, it'll start to eat it up. And then, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes later, something like that, it'll hit your bloodstream and then you'll start to feel it. And then uh, a couple minutes later, you'll be at like peak high, I guess you'll call it. Um, when you inject it into your bloodstream, it's you're high before you're done pushing the, the you know, the syringe. Does does it make the high bigger or uh, stronger? More intense. More intense. More intense because you're not, you don't have that gradual rise. Okay. It's just sober and then boom. Okay. Does it last longer or less time? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Um. You know, I was, uh, I didn't really, I didn't spend a whole lot of time sober right. to be able to tell to you that. Yeah. Way. Gotcha. Um, was talking, you said you, you moved into kind of heroin rather quickly within two months of, of pills, correct? Yeah. Uh, at the, before you hit heroin, how many pills or how many milligrams of, of a specific pill or were you, did you take multiple variations of opioids what was your you know before you hit that heroin point what was your usage a lot um i would you know take 10 5 milligram percocets and put them in my mouth and chew them up um uh take a couple 30 milligram oxycontins and melt them down and shoot them um a lot of money a lot for an individual a 30 milligram is that a lot to take no i i wouldn't say that was a lot somebody who's never done it before would say it was a lot um as a as a opiate addict myself that's not a lot okay um but financially it was it was a lot it pills are a lot of money and so can can you tell me at least you know prices back when you were doing this can you tell me what it what costs are give me some rough ideas of what what an, an average addict would spend per pill for you know to maintain roughly being... roughly a dollar a milligram okay so to get uh to get the to get high you probably need 230s when i when i was at the tail end of my pills right like right before heroin right. i would probably need 230 milligram pills just to get high um and then a couple hours later, I would uh, probably about five hours later, I'd be starting to get sick again. Okay. So, you know, a couple more. So that's, you know, you're looking at $120 that day. Right. Right. And um, so for heroin, um, you know, you can get, you know, a, a, a bag of heroin for $40. You can get a bag of heroin for $20. How much is a bag? Is that a gram? That no, a-, a gram. A gram was like. So a forty dollar bag of heroin when I was doing it was probably like a quarter of a gram, uh-huh. give or take, just depend on who you got it from. Or, but, uh, and and that for me, a, that that bag would last me a couple days. Okay. Um. Definitely towards the end of my using career, that that wasn't the case. Uh, got it. Got you know, just like the pills did, just like just like anything like that does, it just goes really out of control really fast. What, so for an example, what was uh, at the point of extreme? What was the most you were you were using? Uh, talking about the heroin side of it, what was the most of that you were using in a day? In the worst days. Um. Well. So so how it went was um, whatever you could get is 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 what you would use. So let's wow. say let's okay. say let's say I start the morning off, and I have a you know, $40 and I go get a $40 bag of heroin. Um, opiates, when you don't have them and you're addicted and you don't have them, you get really sick. So I'll, so I have this $40 bag of heroin and I'll say, well, I'm going to, I'm, you know, I'm going to do some right now cause I don't want to feel sick, but I'm going to try to make this $40 bag last. Right. Because I don't know when I'm going to have $40 again. I don't know when I'm going to have more heroin again. Right. All right. But let's say I have a hundred dollars and I go get a gram. 
right? Yeah. Now I'll probably do forty dollars worth now, and then throughout the day, you know, whatever, and I, you know, I'll I'll still have some tomorrow for sure because I, you know, I wouldn't do a gram in a day. But uh, so basically, whatever you have right now, you're gonna you're gonna budget it out. If you know you're getting some later, let's get really high right now and feel great. Um, but if you don't, you're just gonna you know try to make sure that you don't get yourself sick. That's yeah. that's that's the game. That's that's the that's the whole that's the day. That's the week. That's the month plan. Is just try not to be sick. Do what you got to do not to be sick. Am I right to think that your your every waking hour is just strategizing? Mm-hmm that fight of that mm-hmm. that addiction yeah yeah it's uh it's um or that it's sickness i guess would be for sure um it's it's crazy but it's uh it's in a weird way it's a distraction for how terrible your life is right okay. so you're constant your mind is constantly busy focused on doing this or that so you don't you don't have a ton of time to stop and think about for me anyways looking back um it was it 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 was a distraction from, I mean, geez, when you're, when you're living in abandoned houses and doing all this crazy stuff, you don't have time to stop and think, geez, what, what am I doing? Right. Right. Um, cause you're either sick and trying not to get sick or, you know, you, you have that rush of an, of, uh, um, dopamine and endorphins when you're, you know, Hey, you know, I just made a score and then you're high again and then the cycle starts all over. Um, it's just this crazy dynamic. Am I right to think that, uh, and I've heard this uh, from somebody else uh, talking about the subject, that the the process of scoring and getting the drugs is is a little bit of an addiction in itself too? Is there because that stimulates something too, and it's mm-hmm. basically like maybe winning a basketball game mm-hmm. kind of kind of feeling? Is that is that a similar experience for you? Yeah, it's it's funny. So when you're when you're sick, when you're withdrawing from opiates, it's it's such a terrible feeling. It's the worst. It's just terrible. But the it's crazy because if I'm really, really sick and um, let's say I get a phone call and somebody's coming over and they, they either have heroin that they're going to let me have or if I have money and they're going to bring me some and, and, and sell it to me, whatever. If, if I, as sick as I am, if I know that I'm just like minutes away, I'm not sick anymore. Hmm. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. It's like, so... So, so what you're talking about with you know the the chase for it being an addiction in itself, maybe because I'm your brain has that for you to not feel sick when you know you're minutes away from getting high, your brain has to have kicked out some endorphins or something, right. dopamine or something. It knows it's coming. Yeah, everything's good now. Mm-hmm. Uh, describe uh, the feeling of sickness to somebody who has no clue what that is. Mm. Um, physically, um sweaty and hot but uh like chilly at the same time okay. um your skin is i've heard a lot of people say crawly but i don't i don't know what crawly means my skin was just really sensitive so so if you were to like grab my arm mm-hmm. it would feel kind of tingly um really 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 tired but you can't sleep um, and then for me, the worst part about, um, being withdrawing from opiates was the psychological and mental and emotional sickness. Um, I have ne- I mean, the deepest, darkest despair, depression, uh, fear and sadness that you can ever imagine. It is, it is so dark and it's crazy. And, uh, deep. Does it take you to a point of delusion at times? Are you are you seeing things? Are you hearing things? Is it? I'm I'm I'm, I'm I've heard a lot of meth stories of having similar things like that. Is there any of that? And is there a component of that at all? I never experienced that. Um, I never experienced any uh, like psychosis type stuff. Is right. that what you're talking about? Yeah, I, right. I never experienced anything like that. Um, but you know, you you can't move. I mean, you just you just lay there, and you can't sleep, but you're tired. You know, you mm-hmm. can't cry, but you're the saddest you've ever been. You just it's it's disgusting. It's terrible. Um, I don't I they I don't think the English language does justice to I can't 
I can't tell you, you can't words start to verbalize that will, it. no. So it, it would be impossible. Like if I said, if there's sort of experience that's not drug related, there's, that's nothing comparable really, at least in your life experience of, of a similar no. feeling. Mm-mm. Okay. Uh, you, you hit on it already, but you know, part of your, your addiction story was, you know, uh, lost a girlfriend that you were with at the time when this started uh and you ended up being homeless is that right yeah okay uh what is homeless life like you know as you remember it under addiction um it's really it's it's weird it's weird because uh you know kind of like I, I i just said before it's it's takes up so much of your time and energy that you're not able to really um, grasp the gravity of where you are and how far you've fallen, right? Is it, is it, is it, am, I, am I understanding that is like you don't even really care at, about the homeless part of it? Absolutely not. I, 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 didn't, I didn't care at all. Um, so It's not like you're saying, oh, I got this addiction issue and I'm homeless. It's just I have this addiction that I need to take care of. And it's regardless yeah. of where your your position is in the world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, so if you think about like so, when I when I talk to people about being homeless, um, a lot of people say, "Geez, I you know I can't imagine that you know," and I so when I'm talking to those people, I I put this analogy in front of them. Think of your values and your moral system like like a bullseye, right? Okay. So a- everything in life is a progression, good things and bad things. You know, you go to school, graduate, get a job, work your way to the top. That's a progression. You don't just you don't just start day one at the top, right? Right. Negative things are like that too. So I remember when I was a kid, um, I was never gonna cuss. Swear words were bad, right? I mean, I may call you a butthead or you know whatever kids do, but I was never gonna cuss because that's bad. Right. And so if 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 I'm the bullseye. And my morals and values are that first ring around the bullseye. As I move closer to that first ring, the first ring moves further. You know, you know what I'm saying? So you, the ring and me move at the same time. So you progress towards your morals and values until one day you find yourself comfortably doing something you swore you would never do. And you don't even think about it because that's just how far you progressed, right? Right. So it wasn't like I... It wasn't like I became homeless and had this, um, you know, moment where I thought, wow, how did I, it was just, today's a little worse than yesterday, but I still got to go get this dope. Right. You know, um, it's just maybe another, it's like, it's like another hurdle in the, you know, getting the drug and, yeah. and getting that just becomes in something else you have to do another ring to jump through. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> another thing about being homeless too, that to me is the most painful and again a lot of this stuff i i never realized until years later you know i mean i've been sober now going on three years and a lot of this stuff i didn't realize until then but the invisibility of being homeless is um i just think the most tragic thing and describe what you i I you know from our pre-conversation you've given me a pretty good idea about it but for the listeners sake describe illustrate what invisible means to you yeah so i'll give you an example um and I'll, I'll i'll describe for you the moment when i had this realization while being sober so my girlfriend at the time or my girlfriend now her and i were uh in minneapolis or in saint paul at a restaurant okay mm-hmm. and we're coming out of the restaurant and we're walking to the vehicle and there's people walking up and down the sidewalk and in this alley, maybe five feet from the sidewalk is a dumpster. And, you know, there's a gentleman digging, digging through that dumpster. And he looks, you know, I would imagine he's between probably 35 and 45 years old. And um, nobody's noticing him as they walk by. And he's not noticing anybody else as, as they walk by. He's just doing, he's in his world and they're in theirs. Wow. Um. And <clears throat> it's <clears throat> as a man, um, I think we all 
when when we're young, <clears throat> we have this this uh, dream or this idea of what being an adult lo- should look like, and um, that's supposed to be, uh, you know, married with a with a family that you love and providing for them and protecting them and coming home and being told that that you're loved. Um, but, but when you're a homeless man, and I can only speak for a man because I'm a man, I can't speak for what it's like to be a homeless woman. Right. But when you're a homeless man, that's, excuse me. Yeah. It's all right. Take your time. That's all gone. That doesn't exist. Um, nobody's, nobody's happy to see you. There's. There's a lot of good people out there that'll stop and give you a dollar. And, you know, we've all seen the people with, with the signs and stuff like that. But nobody needs you. Your, you know, society looks at you as uh, like a nuisance. Um, I'm sure some people here in this are going to think, oh, that's not true. You know, I love all people. Well, there's probably some people that are going to hear this and think, damn right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So everybody feels differently, but... You know, for the most part, you know, you're invisible. Um, like I said, no, no, you, nobody's telling you that, that they love you or need you. And, you know, if you're honest with yourself, it might be hard to tell yourself that you love yourself. Right. Um, it's just terrible. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about survivability, not only just with the drug stuff, but just living. And, you know, where we live in a place that has a really cold climate in the wintertime and all that what were you doing to live? Cause you were literally on the streets. If we're not talking couch surfing or things like that, mm-hmm. uh, what were you doing to survive place to live food and all that was what's going on in this homelessness? Um, so in the spring, summer and fall months, it's, uh, it's not, it's not nearly as bad as in the winter. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll start with food. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, I hate to say it, but you know, you'd walk into a gas station or a CVS or something like that, and you put a muffin in your pocket and a milk jug in your other pocket. You know, like a little, you know, personal milk jug. That 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 was my go-to: was right. a muffin and a little a little milk jug. Um, to for like shelter, um, myself and many 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 people over on the east side of St. Paul would, uh, you know, just go into abandoned buildings. Um, and you, and you're basically just going there to sleep. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you, uh, if you're driving through St. Paul, especially on the east side and you go down these side streets, you'll see a lot of buildings that are condemned or, you know, whatever. And, um, so that's where myself and a lot of us would go. Sometimes we would go there together. Sometimes, you know, I'd be by myself and I'd go to one. Um, I forget what the other question was that you asked. No, I'm just trying, trying to get a, just a just feel. A day, just a day in the life. Day in the life, yeah. And um, what you're doing. What, were there any specific things that were uh, specific hardships or struggles? You know, not talking about you know trying to get drugs, but as far as survivability, things that... Yeah, yeah. Um a really cool thing that I experienced many times was that, uh, cause as I, you know, as I just said, you know, there were homeless people that, you know, I would hang out with. And like I said, we'd go to, you know, houses together sometimes and stuff. And, um, you know, a lot of the homeless people that I met out there took care of, you know, the, the people around them. Does that make sense? It, so, well, am I understanding it right? Is there is there a camaraderie of sorts? I where... would say so for sure. Okay. I mean, not everybody. Some people, you know, probably don't. You know, some people probably just want to be left alone. I know I did at times. Am I right thinking that maybe there's some people, some addicts that are, are a danger to other addicts, and then there's some addicts that are, well, let's team up, let's, let's survive oh, yeah. together, let's get high together, yeah. let's our strength in numbers type yeah. thing? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, okay. all of the above for sure. Okay. Any, any, um, well, tell this one first. You, one of the stories you told me, and I'll ask you something about something different. You, you had a couple run ins with law enforcement while, you know, being homeless. 
Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Tell me one of those or a few of those. Yeah. Um, and how so, they addressed you. And, and, and the one that you told me was, a, is, is I'm, I'm going to call it a quote unquote good story, but mm-hmm. is there any contrast between law enforcement and stuff like run-ins with them? Yeah. So um, I was in an abandoned house uh, on the east side of St. Paul and um, it was a really, really, really beautiful house. Um, it was a shame that it was condemned because it was so beautiful, but it had a three season porch. So it had like a little screen door. And then there was, you know, it was porched in, but screen, you know, it was like a lot of windows. Can you picture that? Mm-hmm. Okay. And and that floor was carpeted. And then there was a big, beautiful wooden door to go into the house. And I can't remember if that door was locked or not. Um, but what I did was I just brought my little sleeping bag and I had my phone charger and I, oh, I had a backpack. Okay. Um, and then that was it. And I, and I, I woke up one morning and there was an officer standing over me and, um, I woke up and I opened my eyes and I, and I looked up at him and he was looking into the big windows into the house. He was on the outside. You were on the inside. Right. He, he would, we were both in the porch. Oh, he was in the porch. Too. He, oh, he okay. was stand. I was laying on the ground. He was standing right over me and looking into the window. Gotcha. And, um, I would imagine that he was just assessing the the area. Right. Um, I, I think because that's a crime to do that. That's a, you know, you can go to prison for breaking and entering. Right. Um, regardless of it's just, a just because a house is condemned doesn't mean somebody doesn't own it. A bank owns it. So, you know, somebody owns it. Right. And so that's that's very illegal to do that. Um, so he looked around, and I I would imagine that he saw that uh, that I didn't wreck anything. You know, I didn't take a crap on the floor. I didn't break any windows. I didn't bust into the door. Is it was that and still a conscious thing to you to be? Yes. To be yes. respectful. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I I saw people do crazy things, and 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 I always thought that like you don't have to do that, you know. But anyways, yeah. So he so he. I would imagine that he saw that I was, you know, probably doing the wrong thing, but somebody that needed some help. And so he could have arrested me right there. Um, but he, he, so then he looks down at me and he sees me just looking up at him and he says, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be back around 10. And if you're still here, then we'll have to figure something out. And I was like, all righty, got it. And he left and so did I. Wow. So is there, is there a, another side? Of, of law enforcement dealing with that? It, it was maybe a less compassionate yes. interaction? Yes. Okay. So this, um, okay, so I'm, I'm homeless. Um, I would imagine I didn't look the greatest. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure I've seen better days. But uh, I was at a bus stop on the corner of Lexington and Randolph. And uh, this this guy came up and, um, and, uh, you know, I want to start by saying that, you know, if this happened today, I probably wouldn't have reacted the same way I did then. Um, I'm not, I don't think that, you know, people should, I don't think either myself or him should act like this. So I just want to say that, okay. but, uh, I'm sitting there at the bus stop. I'm sitting at the bus stop and he walks up and he's leaning with his elbows in the back of the bus stop next to me, but behind and leaning on it. And, uh, he was, he 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 made a comment about how I looked. I can't remember exactly what he said. It was something to the effect of, "Geez, you're really out in public like this," or something like that, right? Unsolicited comment. Just yeah, I did. I didn't say I didn't say a word to him. Wow. And uh, then he said, uh, "Why don't hey, why don't you call your dad and have him send you some money so you can get some new clothes?" And I was I was stunned that anybody would say that. And so my response to him was. Uh, I'd love to do that, but my dad passed away. I don't have that luxury. And I, I, I was sure he would have said, I'm sorry, man. Right. But he didn't. He said it's, uh, it's probably best that way. He'd be really disappointed. And um, so a scuffle broke out. Um, he, was, uh, he ended up on the ground. Um, I had some blood on my shoe. Um. He had a he had a flip phone, and I threw it across the street and took off south down Randolph, and there was this uh, so a block a block south of there there's this gigantic apartment complex okay okay. 
and it has uh, these garage doors um, on the ground level. There's two, three, four of them. And as I'm sprinting away from this from the scene, right, one of these garage doors opens up. And so I just run right in there. And I hang out for a few minutes. Um, and then I walk to the other side of the apartment, and I hit the button, and the door starts going up. And it gets, like, maybe a third of the way up, and I can see cars and and police every so I hit the button again and um you know I'm definitely surrounded for sure and so I go and I find this corner and there was uh there was a couple um like lawn chairs and then there was a like a throw rug um there's a few other things but I used those things to make myself a little barricade in the corner okay and uh I'm sitting there and it's, it's silent forever and all of a sudden, the face of a German shepherd comes uh, between the wall and the and the side of the rug, right? It uh-huh. just pushes his head in there. Now, if my knuckle right here is his eyeball, this is how close his he was to me. And he just grabbed my arm and rips me out of there, right? Is, is it uh, on a leash with a handler or just loose in there? Looking. I don't, I, I, I don't know. I, okay. I, I, I never got a look, but you know how when you play with a dog mm-hmm. and he's holding on to it, he keeps jerking back. Yes. So he's dragging me like this. Okay. Jesus. And, um, these two officers are putting the boots to me. Stop resisting. Stop resisting. And I, I'm, I'm scared. I'm, you know, in shock. I'm in pain. I'm not resisting though. This dog is pulling me. And that's what one of them finally said. One of them finally said, oh, the dog's got him. And so they got the dog off of me and they put me in cuffs and they put me against the wall and, uh, I'm, I'm standing there and I'm, and I'm staring at the wall of this garage and, you know, for a minute or two, I don't know how long, but all of a sudden I I hear somebody yell, put your hands on the wall. And I, and I, I I didn't know what to do because I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm the only criminal here right now, you know? (laughs) Right. But Every you know, the walls in front of me, everybody else is behind me. They have to know I'm cuffed. And so he says it again, put your hands on the wall. And I turned to say, I, I, don't, I don't know what you want me to do. And I got punched in the face. Oh, Jesus Christ. And so I'm on the ground and they pick me up and they put me in the back of the squad car. But this story has a little bit of a happy ending, kind of. Okay. So we go to the hospital. My mm-hmm. arm's pretty messed up. Uh, my arm was fractured. I had, you know, I mean. I'll, it broke bone? Holy yep. shit. Okay. And, uh, you know, I got, I'm bleeding everywhere. And we go at, we're in, and we're at the hospital and this, and this cop has to sit with me for, we were there for a couple hours for sure, right? We got to get my wound cleaned out. We got to get this splint on. We got to do all this stuff. Are you handcuffed still as injured? No. Okay. Just curious. But, but he's in the room with me. Right. And, um, and, and just, are, are you high now or are you feeding no, for drugs now? No, I was, uh, I, w- I was actually sick. Okay. And um, so and and they brought me a couple Percocets, which I thought was crazy, you know, because right. I mean I'm clear, but whatever. And so they brought me a couple Percocets, which which is cool. But I asked this cop because his voice sounded familiar. Right. I said, uh, "Did you punch me in my face when I was handcuffed and with my face against the wall?" And he denied it, and then he denied it, and he denied it, whatever. But we're there for hours, right? And so we start talking, and he starts getting my story, and you know, a- a- after this conversation. He starts to view me, I guess, more as a as a as a human being that has made some bad choices and is in a, pre- a pretty crappy situation, and not so much as just a piece of, t- of trash that you can just punch in the face, right? Right. So we're on our way to the jail at this point, okay? And I'm in the back seat, and his rear view mirror is in, you know in the front, and I can just see this much of his face, right? Right. And we come to a stop sign, and uh, all of a sudden I look up into his rear view mirror, and he's looking at me, and he says. Hey man, I gotta tell you something. And I said, "What's that?" And he said, "I did punch you in your face when you were handcuffed." He said, "I'm sorry, but you have to understand the type of people that we deal with every day." Um, he said, uh, I, I, "I I can't remember everything that he said to me, but uh, he told me if I wanted to file a grievance or whatever, I could." I said, ah, "That's fine," but I just thought that was cool that because I recognized his voice, you know, right. from "Put your hands in the And now I've been talking to him for a while, and you know, he admitted it to me. He became human. Mm-hmm. He saw your humanity, and he, oh man, yeah, you're right. That does have kind of a yeah. At, at least for the fact that you know the bittersweet, one, right, right. 
do you want to tell me how that played out as far as, you know, what you were charged with and, and, and how it was resolved? Yeah, I was charged with uh, aggravated robbery, Okay, which uh, was explained to me that um, if you take a stick of gum off of somebody's person, because uh, cause I threw his phone, if you take a stick of gum off of somebody's person, um, that's robbery, and I used violence, and so okay. it was aggravated robbery. Um, I could have done, you know... 10 years or, you know, whatever the max penalty is at. But, uh, I was in, um, I was in jail in St. Paul for about six months. Um, then I was put on probation for that. Uh, the six months in jail, I'm assuming they're not giving you drugs to maintain fighting off the sickness. Is there, what are they doing for you or did they do anything? Is there, were there treatments offered to you within six months? What was that jail time like? Um, as an addict, the jail time was, uh, I mean, it was good and it was bad. Um, I was able to to get through the sickness, which right. I, I had always told myself if I could just not be sick, I wouldn't do this, right? Um, so I was able to get through the sickness. Um, and I just always think it's 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 really crazy how when you when you think of addicts and alcoholics and homeless people and people in jail, you kind of have this idea of um what they're like but when you get when you get people away from what it is that's making them make bad choices whether it's drugs or committing crimes or this or they're drinking or whatever when you get them away from that and you can and you can uh see the people that's behind that um overwhelmingly all of them have been really cool people so there i mean definitely you don't want to be in jail for a day much less six months uh-huh. Um, but it could have been a lot worse. Um, and then when I got out of jail, you, you wouldn't believe it, but I, you know, I went back to using, is it, um, is it literally like that day? You're just like, okay, I'm out. Let's go. Yes. Wow. Isn't that crazy? It was, it was insane. Crazy, I, but understandable. I so, yeah. It was, it was so weird. I had, uh, you know, I mean, I had built a couple friendships in there and, um, I mean, everybody was all hopeful for me that I wouldn't, and that day I went and used, and I was couldn't believe it when I did it, but I did it. Right, I, I can relate to that story because, um, and I don't know if you, how many of my podcast episodes you listen to. There's one that, that details kind of my my drug dealing days, but I used to, you know, deal crack cocaine pretty regular, and uh, I was got arrested for it, went to jail as I was going through a court process, and. Uh, I was in a, in a county jail for almost a year. I think it was like nine months, you know, as I was going through this, you know, the, the process. And, um, and this is why I, I relate to your story is, is I was in there with people who I sold crack, sold crack to, right? And then I know these people on the streets as being crack addicts, mm-hmm. right? And I know their personality as a crack addict. Mm-hmm. But then we're in, in jail together and they're clean, Right. And they become these different people, yeah. and then I learn, I, I learn their their life experiences. I learn what their interests are. Yeah. I, I I know what kind of music they like. We play cards together, and we, and we're human to human different. And and I'll be honest, I didn't look at it as a crack addict, as a human being. Yeah, it's a source of my income, yeah. and you know. And while I wasn't as as harsh and cruel to them as some other dealers that I know, you know, I, I still had an air of superiority mm-hmm. above them and then seeing them there and learning it, it was really life changing in that aspect of just to appreciate the, uh, you know, the humanity of everybody, you know, cause you see that, like you mm-hmm. said, you see a different person in there. Those mm-hmm. are clean. Sadly, some of these people who I were, who I was, you know, I wouldn't say friendships cause I mean in jail it's yeah, you know, yeah, associated yeah. whatever. I get what you mean. You know, and it was kind of cool to see him, this different person. Like, God, I, you know, where I'm like, kind of like the people you were in jail with was pulling for them. Mm-hmm. Sadly, many, most of them would turn around and be back on the street. Mm-hmm. And I would later find out uh, they were back on crack yeah, and doing the same thing. And then it's, it's just one of the the dark realities of, of drug addiction and that whole thing is just, yeah. you know, it change, alters who you are, even though you're this real person on the inside. Yeah. Um, what else did I want to cover on that part? Um, 
Well, first, I want to ask about, you know, how you um, you you got money for, for drugs and all that. Uh, but let's talk a little bit more about the community of drug users, homeless drug users, at least as it pertains to here in the Twin Cities, as, as you know it. How bad is, is it right now? If, if, what can you give me an idea of numbers? Can you can you how extensive is the problem? Is there enough? resources are there any resources can you give me any kind of just paint yeah. that picture for me yeah um when i was uh when when i was homeless and and using there was <clears throat> there was a lot of there was a lot of people that were in a similar situation that i was in some people preferred meth some people preferred crack right but there was and, and you were inter- intermingled there wasn't like a segregation among drugs it was addicts of different varieties were together kind of thing and um or interacted i guess as i should say that's a good question i never really thought of that um so if uh if one of us had a good idea to go make some money or do something right then sure you know we'll all you know get together but if i'm strictly a heroin person and you're strictly a meth person you know we might go our separate ways because you're not on the tail of, of, of heroin and I'm not on the tail of meth. So you're going to find your thing. I'm going to find mine. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, I mean, living in the abandoned houses, there were, there are many, many times where I was in there with, you know, three, four other people and, you know, who preferred this drug and that drug and whatever. But as far as like the, the density of the population of, of addicts and, and homeless people, just in the East side of St. Paul, I saw, uh, God, I, I would hate to put a spit a number out, because uh, I would imagine it would be way off than what you know what it really right. is, but um, I imagine you're not, you're not taking census counts when you're out. Right, 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 right. But I will say this: I've been to three different treatments, um, and I've never been in one and and seen somebody in there that I knew from the streets. You know wow. what I mean? So you would think you if it was a tighter right, community, it would right? Be, yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean for. Yeah, I would imagine there's a ton of people out there. Here, here's another question, I'm, and it's, it's going to not be one that you're going to be able to accurately answer, I assume. Is But can you give me an idea of, or what you perceive maybe is the percentage of homeless people who are addicts versus people who are just homeless? Is there any, is it 50-50? Is it... I, I, think it's, I, I think it's a lot higher than that okay. because um, most addicts and alcoholics deal with mental health, right? Okay. And uh, a lot of people that experience mental health turn to drugs and alcohol, which, and I'm not shaming them for it. I did it myself. It made me feel comfortable. It, it, it uh, filled holes that were inside of me. So if you, if, if you took somebody at random that didn't have mental health problems and that didn't have substance abuse problems and you just did an experiment and you grabbed them and you brought them to Chicago, and just dropped them off in the street, they're homeless, right? Right. But I would imagine within a day, they're probably going to have at least a beginning of a plan of how to get themselves out of here. I would imagine that they would have went somewhere, called some number to get some help or get something started for help, right? Right. Um, Which, in my case, and everybody that I knew out there, none of us did that at all. Right, because the focus Um, was the drugs. Yeah, yeah, so... Um, I, so somebody who doesn't have mental health or substance abuse problems, the only thing they're going to focus on is the fact that they're homeless, right? Right. They don't have to worry about being sick. They don't have to worry about taking something to feel better inside. They just got to worry about being homeless. So I, I would imagine that the percentage of people homeless that have substance abuse and or mental health issues is going to be very high. I would guess... I, w- I would have to guess in the 80s to 90s. It could be higher. Right. I've probably heard a statistic on it, and that, that, that doesn't sound too far off, at least just how you described it. Um, let's talk now um, about if drugs aren't free. Yep. How are you getting money? How are you funding the drugs that you're using when you're homeless? Oh, man. Give, give <clears throat> me like, I know what the extreme is, but so start out with, what, what, is there a, a, a low end? scam or oh, yeah, process sure. that you're doing and, sure. and tell me about the the one we talked about prior yeah sure low-end scam is you know uh 
call somebody that you know that has some drugs or something and say you want to buy some and just, you know, run off, take off with the drugs because you don't have any money. Um, but, you know, that's that's just going to get you through the next hour or so that, you know, you're never, um, I mean, going out at night and, and stealing stuff out of people's yards, bikes. Um, again, I, I would like to say that uh, I think that's just terrible and um I did it myself. I was never proud of it. Uh, I always felt bad doing that. Um, right, but if you sell something like a bike, are you are you you had a phone? You maintain a phone. Are you doing Craigslist stuff? Or are you just trying yeah. to find somebody? Are you trading things for drugs at all? I know that when I was dealing, that was a that was a part of it too. That people would mm -hmm. bring you items of value and yeah. trade you for drugs. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, ab absolutely. Um, you know you come across a bike or a cell phone somehow or whatever, you know, somebody will, somebody will give you something for it, whether right. it's money or, or, you know, the drug you want, or maybe a different drug and you can take that different drug and give it to somebody that'll give you the drug you Trade want, drug you know, it's, um, but yeah, uh, I, I never felt good about it. Um, I, that's sounded kind of pretentious to say, I don't think most people feel good about doing that because your soul, your, your conscience knows that that's bad, whether in the moment you're, you're affected by that or not, your soul or your conscience is, um, I, I, I got a Craigslist story that I, that I can tell you though. Um, Go ahead. this is a result of not liking to take things from people that didn't belong to me, especially when they didn't deserve it. Mm -hmm. Um, this was pretty creative, I think. Um, so what, what, uh, me and a friend did is we put an ad on Craigslist and um, we posed as a female. And the few pictures that we used were um, of an ex-girlfriend of one of her friends that was, you know, very petite. I mean, she was of age, but she didn't look like it. She right. looked, she looked, I mean, if she you She was told, in that, that underage, above yes, age spectrum yes, kind yes. of Yes, If she told you she was 18, you'd believe it. But if she told you she was 16, you'd believe it too, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we would do is we would... Uh, I mean, we would just, it was insane how many emails we would get crazy, insane. And we would, uh, we would weed through them. Um, you know, Hey, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm between jobs. Okay. We're probably not going to email that guy back. Right? right. And after a day or two of, of emailing them and, um, you know, kind of talking sexy with them, which was pretty weird. Right. <laughs> if you can imagine, um, at that point, we would uh, send a message saying something like, uh, hey, um, I got to tell you something, but, you know, I don't know how you're going to react. I'm actually only 15, but I turned 16 in a couple months. Um, but I really think you're cool. But I understand if you don't want to talk to me anymore. And some of them would say, oh, geez, I'm sorry. Yeah, I can't talk to you. But some of them wouldn't. Right. And some of them... Uh, some of them would graphically describe sexual things, right, to who to who they believe as a fifteen year old child. Jesus. And uh, there's a there's a restaurant on uh, Arcade um, that uh, the restaurant is in the middle of the parking lot, right. and then so all the parking spaces are up against a curb. Okay. Okay. So we would set these meetings up with these guys that think that they're going to hook up with a fifteen year old girl, and. Um, so we so we would set the meeting for seven o'clock or whenever and then we you know they would tell us what vehicle they're in and uh me and a friend would pull up and park in front of them so that right. they couldn't you know so they're blocked in and then jump out and show them their emails and say look dude that was that's my little sister that, that you're talking to um one of two things is going to happen right now i see you got a wedding ring on your finger she's probably going to leave you if i call the police uh, looks like you're driving a, a work vehicle that your job's probably gone because you're going to be spending years in prison, you know, or you can give us a few hundred bucks. What's it going to be? Right. And uh, all of them but one paid. And the reason we parked in front of them is because the very first one that we did, we didn't park in front of them. And, and as soon as we pulled up next to him, he took off. I, I can't help but appreciate you doing it like, yeah, it's, you're, you're, Dealing with your addiction, your feeding yeah. addiction, but you're also fighting crime. Hey, felt like <laughs> the, the Boondock process, Saints, right? Holy shit! Ah, uh, that that's 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 wild. And it, I, when we were talking about that before, prior, it's you know, it's that's a crazy problem within yeah. itself. Yeah. You know that these these two problems are interceding. You know, mm -hmm. there's the addiction problem and drug use, and then there's a 
the problem of there's, you know, like I covered in a, in a previous episode about people who actually do that, go out yeah. and kind of set up people to know that there's it's easy. that many. It's easy. It's Any, terrifyingly easy that there's that many of them. There. Anybody that, that just heard the story that I just told, I challenge you to do this. It takes a minute to, to put up a Craigslist ad. Just put one up, not necessarily posing as an underage girl, just as a girl, period, and see how many emails you get in an hour. I'm telling you, just try it. Holy shit, dude. That's, see, that's the, oh, God, okay. Uh, that makes my skin crawl more than, yeah. than drug use <laughs> stories yeah. and anything else. Um, something you kind of hit on when you talked about, um, you know, feeling bad about theft and all that. And you talked about, you know, you, you recognize that it's bad, even though you continue to do something like that. Is there a lot of time when you're in your, your darkest points of addiction where you, you, you reflect on it? Like, God, I don't want to do this. You know, am I, is there a conscious thought about that? It could be when you're putting it in the drugs into your body, when you're, when you're out looking for the, are you, do you, are you, maybe daydreaming about what sobriety would be like and like is there that longing for that at all yeah with uh with the with the mental health stuff that uh, i personally have dealt with um masking and lying to yourself is something that i've always done does that make sense right so i hope this makes sense but it probably won't so while i was out there doing you know doing drugs and homeless and ho- being homeless and stuff. Um, my, my brain always made me think I never, I never, th- I, I always thought that in a day or two, something's going to happen. You know what I mean? Right. That probably doesn't make sense, but that's what my brain did probably to protect myself. Um, Cause if I sat there thinking this is going to be the rest of my life, you know, who knows? Geez, I probably wouldn't have wanted to be alive, you know, but. And my understanding is that like you're tricking yourself into thinking yes. two more days, everything's going to be yeah, fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or, shit. or, okay. you know, you know, I would tell myself, you know what, dude, Friday, I'm going to treatment. That's okay. what I'm going to do. Or, you know, Friday, I'm going to go, you know, reach out for help or something like that. But for these next few days though. Yeah, I'm yeah, keep, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Man, many times that exact. That exact process many times happened where I was like, I'm just you know, live what, it up dude, until let's, Friday. Let's go, let's go get crazy. Let's put some Craigslist ads up. Let's go nuts, and then we'll go to treatment. You know, many okay. times. Gotcha. Um, well, this is going to kind of you know, the next stuff is going to kind of uh, transition into you know the point of rock bottom and 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 finding a correction. Uh, but you had you're thinking four to five moments of of overdose, mm-hmm. right? So. If you can take it back to the first one, you know, w- w- tell me what is an overdose? Is it is it is it putting too much drugs into your body at one time, mm-hmm. or is it just your body is just maybe reacts differently on that particular day to a normal amount? Both. Okay. Um. There was a. Uh, there was there was uh, one time for sure where um you know I overdosed. And I was taken by ambulance, but uh, I didn't feel that I needed it, right. right? So I, you know, I was conscious and stuff, but they still had to take me in and check me out because somebody called an ambulance because, you know, so, um, somebody every time I overdosed, somebody called the police. Right. And uh, there was one time where uh, I was at a friend's house, and there was like six of us down there, seven of us down there, and I was the only person who did heroin. Okay. Everybody else did meth. Okay. Okay. So uh, I went and can I, can I ask you something about that? Is there any hierarchy within drug use? Do meth people look down on heroin people? Is there yeah. like a is there a yeah a yeah stepping so, stone category? So whatever drug you do is mm-hmm. the most righteous one. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I. I didn't, I mean, we're all homeless. We're all doing drugs, but there is a lot of people that would try to talk heroin addicts that would talk about how bad meth is. And, and there are a lot of meth people that, you know, talk about how bad heroin is because they're both terrible. But just like in life, if I'm doing something, I will, I'll be able to justify it. Right. right. Yeah. But if you're doing something that I don't agree with, it looks a lot worse, even if they both suck. Right. But I'm doing it so I can justify it to myself. Okay. But yes, yes, yes. They, uh, I mean, for real and jokingly, right? Okay. But uh, so so I so I did some heroin. Mm-hmm. I shot up some heroin, and uh, you know, I I probably nodded off, 
and what nodding off is is you know if you you know if you do I'm trying to think how this will be let's let's use easy numbers right let's okay. say i did one dose of heroin and that's my and that's my normal dose okay okay that's not any measurement that's just easy easy numbers to digest if i do one dose of heroin i'll be just fine no sick i'll feel great right but if i do like one and a quarter dose then i'm going to be like maxed out probably not very safe but i'm not my heart's not stopping or anything you know what i'm saying and so then you kind of just like slump over a little bit um you know Somebody who doesn't know what that is would think that was an overdose, okay? Okay. So what happened was... Is, I, it, is that, like, if you're just slumped over, not in an overdose state, that's where the pleasure is happening, or... No. No. No, I never thought so. Okay. I mean, why pay 40 bucks for a nap, right? Oh, so you're you're unconscious at that. It's not like you're just in this euphoric state, you're... No, no, you're, no. Oh, what, okay. When, when you're nodding off, you know, you're... I don't know if it would technically be called sleep, but you're, 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 you're not awake. Okay. But uh, so I did that, and um, everybody ran out of the house. Because they thought you were dead. Yeah, well. Or thought you were dying. I, I could have been. That's the thing, too. I could have been. I just don't feel like I, you know what I'm saying? Right. So so what happened was the neighbor was doing her dishes, and she knew that people did drugs there. Okay. And she called the police. Okay. And so. Oh, it was none of the people there who gave a shit, the, the, any of the people in there doing math. Yeah, 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 yeah. They just wanted to cover their ass. Yeah. So they took off, um, and the reason I don't know if that would technically be an overdose is because as soon as the EMTs grabbed me, I woke up, and so all, all the other times I woke up at the hospital, came to in the hospital. Um, What's that interaction like with, with uh, EMS when they're responding? How are they treating you? And it, it, it's probably different every time for whoever, Yeah, but that particular time where they where they... That's the only like a human being. That's the only time I was ever conscious during that. Mm -hmm. The other times I woke up in the hospital. Right. But I I don't remember them treating me bad. But in the hospital, um, it was always at Regions um, because I was over on the east side of St. Paul, and uh, I remember the first time that I overdosed. This um, so so I come to. This is the first time that I overdosed, so I don't really know what happened. I, I am kind of scared. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, you're, they're done doing everything. I'm, I'm fine. I'm alive. And, you know, they're going to get me out of here real soon, but, you know, they're just waiting on some paperwork. And then somebody would come in and talk to me and uh, try to convince me, hey, here's some information about treatment. You know, how old are you? Oh, geez, you know, you shouldn't be out here. This is scary. Do you know what just happened? Right. And, um, thank you, ma'am. But, you know, I appreciate it. Uh, can I go though? Oh yeah, we're just waiting on this. And then somebody else would come in and social workers and whatever. And they sent a lot of people in there to talk to me. Yeah. And, um, you know, after a couple hours, finally, I was just like, well, what paperwork are you, are you waiting for? Like, I'm just going to leave. Okay. And so then the second time that I overdosed, was a similar situation. Is there is there no like police have to be called? I don't know how that works. Is it, if you come in for an overdose of drugs, do you are you required to make a police report or is it no? Okay, no. I didn't know how that was. No. Um, so then the second time that I overdosed, it was the same thing, sending people in and out. So, but I was only there for like an hour. Right. Okay. The third time. Um. Same thing some paperwork. Hey, do you want to go to treatment? You know, there's a place. It, okay. The last time that I overdosed, and this is one of the things that uh, really, really made me, you know how I said, there's been a bunch of times where I said, I'll go on Friday. Right. This really pushed me into, I need to go now. Um. So not only did I always go to regions when I overdosed, but there was this one nurse that happened to always be there too. And she was a blonde lady and she had, she wore her hair in like, like an African way or something, but she was a, she was a Caucasian lady, but right. really cool, really beautiful. Right. right. And, um, she was always there and, uh, she was wheeling me to the, you know, I, I, I hadn't been there very long at all cause I'm still kind of groggy. Right? right. And she's wheeling me to the to the lobby of the hospital i don't remember being in the room at all okay, okay? and i jokingly said to her geez aren't you guys gonna give me a speech or something right and she looked at me like like an angry mother would look at a child who's you know just keeps making the same stupid mistake 
And she says, we already gave it to you. And then just walked away from me. And in that moment, I'm thinking, I'm already dead to them. Right. You know? Holy shit. They, yeah. they, they, they're in their, in their minds, I'm dead. You're a lost and, cause. At this and, point. and they're doing that because they don't want to keep putting energy into something that is going to turn up dead one day because they believe I'm going to turn up dead one day. So why, why put the energy in there? Jesus. And yeah, that was a, that was a powerful moment right. in, in my addiction. A couple more questions about that is number, number one, how do they, uh, what are they treating you? How are they treating you when you come in for an overdose? Do you, as you know it, at least, what are, are they, are they, what are they giving you? What are the, what is the process to, to save you? What's going on with that? So when, when, when I would, when I would show up unconscious, right. they would Narcan me. Okay. Um, when I. And describe to, to the listener what, what that is and what does that do to somebody who's, you know, under the, uh, you know, the effects of uh, heroin. So what opiates do is um, when they enter your bloodstream and they go to your brain, there's receptors in your brain that um, that opiates attach to, um, and what and 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 when they attach to those receptors in your brain, that's what gives you the high. That's what um, messes with your um, your your lungs and your heart and your breathing. It. So to, so when we take when we take opiates, we're feeling great and we're feeling high, but there's a lot happening in our bodies, and it all starts when those opiate things hit the receptors. What Narcan does is it goes into your bloodstream and it goes to your brain and it kicks the opiates off of those receptors, and um, it will save your life because you know I mean you're not going to be. It's 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 like instant too. Isn't yes. It? Okay. Yeah. It immediately yeah. takes you out. So when you when a person dies of a heroin overdose, is that is it their body body is shutting down? Do you know scientifically what's happening from death? Hmm. No, I don't. I okay. I know that uh, I I know that they'll stop breathing. I know that that kills a lot of people. Is, it just, is like organ function d- stops from the I, I, again? If you don't know it, I, I'm just asking yeah. I don't what you know. Do know. The the only reason I know that the breathing and stuff stops is because how you tell if somebody's nodding off or overdosing is if their lips are blue or, or turning, turning colors, okay. then you know that they're not getting, you know, enough oxygen. So okay. I know if you take too much of opiates, yeah, you're, you know, you're going to stop breathing and stuff. I don't know about your other organs, like your liver and kidney and stuff like that, but definitely you're breathing. Okay. Uh, last question before we move into the recovery phase. Um, have you ever been around somebody who did die? Yeah. Can you tell me what that experience was like? Um, weird. Okay. Is it somebody that you're doing drugs with? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, tons of people that, I, that, that I've known have died. Um, so you've, you've witnessed the death of multiple people? No, no, no. I, um, I had a friend, it was me and three friends. We were in the cities. Uh, we all took turns going into the bathroom at a Walgreens. And, and did heroin. Okay. And he died in that bathroom. Wow. And um, then... Uh, so is it is it like uh, whoever his name is, is where well, he sure has taken a long time mm-hmm. kind of thing? And mm-hmm. how do you react to that? What do you do? Do you go investigate? Do you... Well, um, I don't know if every Walgreens is like this, but a lot of the ones that I've been into are... You have to punch... The, the staff has to punch in a code. Exactly. Um. And, uh, so she had to punch in the code and open the door and, you know, there he was laying there. Um, then we, you know, we had to call the police. Um, not proud to say this, but the, the friend, the other friend that I was with, I mean, we left, um, not proud to say that he wasn't, I don't want to justify leaving somebody like that, right. but, uh, just, you know, keep in mind, these aren't people that I've known forever. These are people that I've met on buses, you know, stuff like that. Um, but still, um, yeah, I don't feel I don't feel good telling you that that we opened the door and saw him, and then hey, we need to get out of here. That doesn't make me feel good. A little self preservation has to kick in because yeah, you know, wow, okay. Do we determine what I don't know, in the pre conversation or or you know the interaction with the that last nurse who basically kind of gave up on you? Uh, do we have a defined rock bottom moment 
where now you need to fix this? Mm. Or was it really just a, a com- combination of, of multiple things and maybe some clarity? Yeah, I think um, I, I think it became very real when when she said that. When it clicked in my brain that 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 I'm dead to these people, um, and they know what they're doing, and they've seen this before, and this, the, you know, the opiate epidemic and all this stuff. So this isn't new to them. Um, yeah, that was scary for sure. Um, rock bottom is like basically from the day that I was homeless is rock bottom. Um, after, you know, that whole experience, that whole multiple year experience. Yeah. After I became homeless, you know, doing things that I never thought I would do. Um, you know, it, it just doesn't feel good when you wake up every day and everything you do is bad. And, you know, especially when you want to do good. Right. Um, I, my whole life, I've just wanted to make people happy and, I just wanted to have fun and 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 here I am everybody that I come into contact with I'm either taking something from or scamming on or something right? right um so I can't I can't really say one day out there was worse worse than any other um they all had their ups and downs some were for sure worse than others but you know it was like I told you earlier <laughs> I don't think about this stuff, right? Like mm-hmm. <clears throat> when we came in and, and, and started talking today and I was getting, it was tough for me to talk about because uh, it's just hard to think about. Right. And so, yeah, I, I can't pinpoint one, but it, it all sucked. Okay. So w- let's talk about the day uh, you eventually decided to go to uh, Fairview Riverside, right? Yep. That day, ha- had you gone to bed or sleep the night before knowing you were going to do this? Did you wake up and immediately go? Was there a, take me through that, the day that this, you, you went there, what was the decision process? What was the influence? What was the thinking at that time? Mm -hmm. So, um, not only did I go to regions every time I overdosed, but, uh, I would go there often because they had computers in their lobby. I don't know if they still do now, but I spent a lot of time there. And, uh, I had, I had, uh, I, I had walked to regions from, I don't know where, um, I was walking with somebody that, you know, was also homeless, but he looked so bad that I didn't want him to come in to regions with me to use the computer because it's supposed to be for patients. Right. Right. So, you know, it would be obvious that he was somebody who was in a, yeah, and hey, I'm sure I looked like shit too. I'm sure I looked terrible too, right? Right. But I mean, he had like a beard that he hadn't shaved in forever, and like, you know what I mean? Right. I uh, a lot of times I would go into Walmart and change clothes in their in their dressing rooms and then leave. Um, my hair was always short, so maybe I could pull off. I don't know. Right. Anyways, I'm just saying, hey, dude, I want to use this computer. I think if we both go in, somebody's gonna come and say, "What are you guys doing?" Right. Right. So I had him sit out. Um, in uh, so there's like a for like valet or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. there's like a driveway. And then beyond that, there's a retaining wall. And, uh, now mind you, I'm doing drugs and stuff. So my thinking is not very clear. Right. I probably change my mind all the time. Exactly. And, uh, I'm sitting there and, you know, I was trying to email and put something together and my phone was probably charging. That's, you know, I, I would go to, uh, I would go to regions a lot to use their computer because it was just so much easier to, uh, Craigslist and email and all this stuff. Um, and I, and I was sitting there at the computer and whatever I was, whatever I was doing on the computer that I was hoping would turn into drugs or money didn't work. And I'm looking out the window at this, you know, just, just rough looking dude who's sitting there for hours, just sitting there, just waiting because I'm the only hope for either of us to get any drugs today. Right. Wow. And I'm just sitting there and I just remember thinking like, I don't want to go back out there. I don't want to be here either. You know, um, so what I did was, uh, I, I went to, I went to, uh, the, a, a police officer, I think, I don't know if it's a St. Paul police officer, but there's somebody there with a uniform and a badge 
And uh, I asked him about getting like a bus token or something like that because I need to go to treatment or something. I, I, don't, I don't remember what I said to him, but somebody gave me one. Okay. <clears throat> and I used that to get to Fairview. <clears throat> Take your time. I know stuff is hard to talk about, and it's hard to revisit things, and it's hard to look at it from the position you're in now. So I just remember having this overwhelming feeling of, it's over. Really? Good feeling, then. Is this right? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, it was amazing. I had nothing. I had, I had a pair of uh, red shorts. I had a Superman tank top. I had a mohawk. I had a phone and a charger. I had tennis shoes, and that was it. <clears throat> but I felt great. And, uh, so I, <clears throat> so I went to treatment and I did really good. Um, I was really blessed to have a lot of really good people in there too. Um, Fairview is a really, really, really great place to go. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's the University of Minnesota. Um, it's their hospital. All right. Super cool. Um, and so I went there. And so do you just want to continue? Like, do you want me to tell you, like, what, what went from there? Or? Just give me give me an, an overview or give the listener an overview of, you know, what treatment is like. You don't have to get extensive with the details, but just, you know, what, what tools, what techniques, mm -hmm. you know, are they using at this point? You know, how do, how do they receive you? You know, I'm sure there's a, you know, there's probably a, a medical physical involved. Yeah. But, you know, what what are they doing? What's an, what's an experience like for, you know, for an addict going in? I I thought it was great. I um I I enjoyed treatment. Um it was well <clears throat> I was homeless though too. You know what I mean? Right. So it wasn't like I was leaving my wife and kids or you know what I'm saying? Right. I was coming off the street with nothing. So it was a safe place food um and and then there's for the most part everybody there wanted to be there too so that was cool that was great safe place um as far as like techniques and stuff um there's so much that goes into why a grown human being with common sense and stuff would throw everything away and just live homelessly doing drugs that it's impossible to fix that in 30 days, right? Right. But what they do, and it's so valuable, and I'm grateful that they do it. I'm grateful that treatment centers are available. So what they do is they, first of all, they dry you out, okay? You're not using, you're not drinking for 30 days. Um, How hard was your experience for the drying out process? It wasn't hard at all. Really? Okay. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't hard at all. I... Uh, is heroin one of the drug? I, you know, and I get kind of confused. It's, I know some like alcohol. I know for sure is one of them. That if you just go cold turkey, it can kill you. Is heroin one of those drugs, or is there? I don't, I don't think so. I've heard some people. I've heard some people say that heroin and alcohol are the only two that can kill you. I've heard more people say alcohol is the only one that can kill you. I don't think heroin can kill you, but I've heard a couple people say that it can. Withdrawing. Right. I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, alcohol is very dangerous though. Okay. Um, but yeah, you feel like you're going to die for sure. But when you go to, okay, so you go to detox first, you don't just cut, you don't. So when you go to treatment, I'm sorry, I, I forgot that part. Yeah, no problem. You don't just walk in and then the next day you're in treatment doing, going to class and group and stuff. So you go to detox first and that's where you get dried out and you know they give you some meds to help with the withdrawal symptoms and you know it's it's relaxed like hey if, if, if you want to just lay down all day go ahead there's no you, you don't have to do anything um and then from there you go to treatment so by the time you get to treatment you are you are dried out okay and uh you know you're able to think clear and you're not having to suffer through withdrawals and stuff like that is the the drying out process um it's basically fighting through the sickness that you fought that you were dealing with or, or trying to alleviate with getting more drugs. Mm -hmm. 
So obviously there was a point that you hit that was past the point that you were ever experienced while pursuing the drugs because you would get the drugs and be mm-hmm. and be pacified. So how did that differ? How dark, how painful, physical feelings, uh, nightmares, any of that stuff, any kind of feedback you can give me of what that was like getting past that point, the farther you've ever been before mm-hmm. since being addicted? Well, thankfully... Um... Like I said, they 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 give they give they medicate you to help you with that. What do they What do they give you? Um, they can give you Suboxone. They can give you Methadone. They can give you muscle relaxers because, like I said, you're really tired but you can't sleep, so that'll help knock you out. Um, they give you uh, uh medicine for nausea. Um, you know they they'll they'll give you medicine to help you uh go to the bathroom because opiates block you up. I heard that too. Yeah, pretty good. So. I mean, it's not, it's not, um, it's not the easiest thing. It's still a little uncomfortable, but it's nothing like it is with, without help. And I think too, the psychological fact of knowing that you're on your way to something better, that probably helps you feel better too. It's a reward thing. So, yeah. Uh, Is is there, uh, you know, and here's the thing is, is is I'm a, I'm a, a marijuana user. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm clean right now. I, I, I like to, you know, go through spells of, of just to, you know, clean out my system and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, when you stop doing marijuana, for instance, uh, you get very intense dreams, very detailed, very vivid dreams. Is there any kind of similar experience or is there a, a nightmare? Compl- is there anything mentally going on like during sleep? from that regardless if they're giving you something to, to you know to help alleviate that are you experiencing anything like that yeah so um your anxiety is really high for sure that's probably um when when you're in detox they can keep your symptoms pretty managed but for me the anxiety was still there so it's like i'm tired but i you know i i can't really sleep i don't want to sit down but i don't want to move around so that's uh that's hard to navigate, but the worst part about that is when you finally do lay still enough for long enough mm-hmm. to get to sleep, um, the slightest tiny thing will, will wake you up from it. So, so your body, when you're laying there real still, its anxiety is slowly coming down, and then you doze off a little bit, right? right. And then something startles you and wakes you up, you're going instantly from here to here. So it's like uh, I don't know how to explain that, but it that sucks. Okay. I, I hated that, but from from point of relaxation to immediately yeah. point of anxiety. Yep. Okay. So yeah, that's you know that's tangible. Um. Now you relapsed a few times, mm-hmm. and that's past the point of going to to Fairview, right? Yep. So uh, take for instance your first relapse. Is this you know after leaving Fairview they said okay. Here you go. You're you're clean now, and you go out in the streets. and And can you e- explain to me how you got from from clean to first relapse? Yep. So after Fairview, um, there's uh there's things called halfway houses, mm-hmm. and uh, what those are is they're facilities that are um, structured and treatment like but they're not as intensive um, care, right? Mm-hmm. So how do you end up at a halfway house? Well, you can go there from, from treatment. Um, if you're being released from prison and you don't have anywhere to go, um, you can go to the halfway house for that. Um, is, is, that is, is that intermingled? Are you, are you, as somebody who went to treatment on your own, are you going to a halfway house who are people who are prison release it can be okay i didn't know if they kept them separate or in my experience i don't think i don't think i i don't think anybody was there from prison in my experience but you know maybe my first week there somebody was just leaving that came from i don't know okay um i don't remember that but anyways so I, i i get to the halfway house and um you know i'm feeling really good um i got a job right away um, I was working at a gym. Um, I was doing sales at the gym, um, really enjoying myself. A couple months later, I had my own place. Uh, I was renting a house with a buddy. Um, 
And then one day, it was just the strangest thing. It was uh, it was like 10 o'clock at night. I should have been going to bed to get up for work the next day. And uh, I don't remember what I thought. I don't remember. Um, I vividly remember sitting in a chair in my living room with all the lights off, wait, looking out the window, waiting to see a car coming down the road, thinking, wait, what, what did I do? What, how did this happen? You yeah. know? And... Uh, Geez, I'd made the mistake of saying, you know, well, he's already on his way. I don't want to, you know, that'd be rude to say, you know what, I had a second. So I'll just do, I'll just do this once, you know, and that never works. Never works for me. It'll probably never work for you or anybody. It just, it's not a good idea. So I relapsed and, um, off and running pretty hard. That relapse was, uh, that's when that one. So after that, it was a month or two after that, that I was in, the Walgreens when my friend that when you know okay. that dude that dude I know had passed away in the bathroom right so off, off and running pretty good um homeless but couch crashing right so not like it was before um do you do you immediately go back to the same amounts and things like that or is that mm-hmm. okay no I didn't okay. um some people do and some people overdose by doing that um, so I wasn't out there long. Uh, I went back to treatment, which was embarrassing. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine that? Oh my goodness. That was embarrassing because when I had left there, a lot of people had very high hopes for me, right? Staff and the people there. And so when I went back very shortly after that, that was humbling. Um, how, how did they, they treat you though? I mean, very, they... very, very good. Okay. Very good. Um, because they, you know, and we talked, but this is one, something we talked for free recording. You had a kind of perception that, you know, you failed and it was unique to you that no one else did this. So yeah, speak yep. on that a little bit. Yeah. So um, when I, when I graduated treatment the first time and when I got my job and I'm, and I'm, you know, living at my own place, um, I just thought that this was it, you know, Hey, that was a pretty terrible few years of my life here i am this goes I, back to you thinking telling yourself if you could just get past yeah. the sickness part everything was gonna be good yep. cool. and it was good my life was really really good um the people around me really had fun with me um so then i relapsed and uh i was i i i was really humbled by that and i was scared to go back to treatment but i knew i had to because i didn't understand that No, this addiction thing is really crazy, and you're probably going to have to do this more than once, probably more than twice, right? A lot of people do. I didn't get that. And so then going back the second time, I remember... Did did they warn you of that in treatment, or and you just didn't believe it? They probably did, but I didn't... Just put it out of mind, like, no, it's different. I don't remember it, because I just was so sure that I would be fine. Right. So that relapse didn't scare me that much. That relapse kind of made me think, like, okay, okay. Um, brought my guard up a little bit. Okay, this is this is this is a legit deal. Okay, let's try this again. Right. So I go to treatment again. Um. Went to another halfway house, uh, in Princeton. Um, I did really good there too. Um, and uh, by doing really good, is that is that just? I'm sure there's there's steps of the procedure of you know recovery and you're just going through them efficiently and you're not I was just really uh active in 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 like the treatment center okay so I was uh I enjoyed going to group right, right. um you're maximizing the the tools they gave yeah, you yeah because yeah. this stuff it's it's such a weird thing. There there's no way you can go to treatment for 30 days and just know everything, okay? Exactly. So the first time I went through treatment, I went through with this attitude of like hey, I'm not sick anymore, so, you know, I like it here. I'll finish treatment, but I'll be fine. You know what I'm saying? Like that guy over there who's been here 10 times, he probably needs to hear this a little more than I do. Not in a bad way. That's just how confident I was in myself. Understood. So then my second time, you know, I'm I I'm, I'm, I'm really active. The people that work there would probably call me a leader. Okay. Um, I took it serious. I was, I wanted to learn why, 
why did I do that last time? What happened? Okay, um, why am I like this to begin with? Um, you know, what, what can I do differently this time to make sure that doesn't happen again? Stuff like that. And so I get out of treatment again. And uh, again, I was, I, was, I was doing good. Um, and then uh, <clears throat> that's when I met Taryn. Who, who is Taryn? Um, For the listener. Taryn is a beautiful, sweet, loving person. Um, we've been together for uh, three years now. Um, <clears throat> and I don't think I'd be here if it wasn't for her. I don't think I would at all. And uh, <clears throat> you, know, you know how when we were talking about the invisibility and like the emotional, mental stuff that being homeless and being an addict does to you? Yes. It was meeting her. <clears throat> that made me aware of all that meeting her and spending time with her <clears throat> and feeling love made me aware of how long it had been since I had felt that. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Um, and, uh, I mean, geez, she's just so great. I, 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 I wouldn't be here without her. She should have left a million times. Um, but she didn't. And I thank her for that every single day. Um, but I did relapse with her. Um, and that was... <clears throat> that's Out of everything I've ever done, that's the most ashamed I've ever been. Is when I relapsed with her. Um, Felt like, like betrayal a little bit to her? You Like you betrayed her trust? Or what, what, what are you feeling? Found it, you know, you found this person that loves you and you love them and... Is that, you know, I, I'm imagining that it's kind of what it feels like as you... Yeah, it's like, you know, <clears throat> she's the only person on this earth that, that, that looks at you with anything but disgust. And you're going to do this? <clears throat> yeah, it was hard. I, uh... We, we don't even really talk about that period you know what i mean right we've never like said like let's not talk about this stuff we just don't because uh it was really hard on both of us i can imagine it's really hard on both of us that's probably the most underappreciated part of, of of the addiction cycle and all that is not only are you detri doing detriment to yourself mm -hmm. you know, physical mental whatever you know, you're destroying anybody who cares about you too, yeah. because I mean, they have to, you know, suffer with that. And it's, I, I would assume similar to, you know, to a loved one dying, you know, but you're, they're not dead. They're just this, the person they were kind of back to what we were talking about, about being clean in jail versus being on the outside is the person they know, the person they love, it disappears for a little bit mm -hmm. and they lose that person and they deal with that. So I can imagine yeah, how that is. Yeah, I, it's it's a miracle that that she's still here. Right. And uh, <clears throat> thank God that, you know, I've been sober for a long time now. And <clears throat> so I went to treatment again, right? Right. And <clears throat> I got out of treatment. Immediately got a job. Immediately we we you know we 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 got an apartment. And so I'm so thankful that I haven't done anything in a very long time. To, to hurt her or to betray her trust or to, um, you know, I've, I've done a lot to make up for, for what I did, but I'll never, I'll never be able to totally, um, make up for, for doing that to her. You know what I mean? Right. In, in my eyes, maybe she might tell you something different. Right. She might tell you, you know, if, if you ask her, I don't know, she might tell you like, yes, that did suck, but geez, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I stuck around. I, you know, right. I don't know, but in my eyes, that'd be hard. A uh, couple of parts about the the recovery thing I want to talk about. I want to talk about your, um, you know, aside from from her and what she did, you you gave me a really good uh, analogy about that. So I want to talk about that. But first, what's you also discovered in within the treatment, you know, you had some mental health things that you were later diagnosed for, mm -hmm. and uh, and that was both uh, anxiety and depression. Correct. Yep. So can you speak a little bit about you know, uh, how that played into your addiction 
and then also how your addiction affected those diagnoses that mm -hmm. you were dealing with? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I've been in treatment a few times, and you know, I've, I've I've learned a thing or two about addiction, and through all the information that I've uh, you know gathered and listened to and all this stuff a lot of this is as things that I have come to conclusions with in my head um, but I believe that I became an addict because of my mental health stuff the anxiety the depression um, I remember um, growing up that uh, and again this isn't things that I was conscious of this is things that looking back now I just, I can see, but I remember growing up that, um, I, I did things because I wanted to be a part of something. I, you know, I, nothing I did when I was young was genuine. Okay. That, that, that's a good way of putting it. Everything I did, there was a reason for doing it. And it wasn't because this is what's best for me, or this is what I want to do. Everything I, all the decisions I made, everything I did was based on, I just want the people around me to like me, appreciate me, think I'm cool, think I'm funny. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, you know, anxiety, depression and stuff like that. I, I don't know if I had depression my whole life. I don't think I did, but I definitely had anxiety. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I masked all of that stuff with humor and trying to trying to leave this facade that in here and in here I'm okay by um, you know doing decent in school, playing sports, being well you know being funny and well liked by my friends. But in here there was in, in here mental and emotional health that um, it was inevitable that I was going to end up where I was going to end up. I think. Right. I don't you know. Maybe if there was some super doctor who could see, you know, who's that good that could have said, hey, dude, you're showing these signs. Here's what you need to do. Maybe. But untreated, un unacknowledged, unaware of, I was going to end up there. Right. So. Okay. I, I can, and, and, you know, I always, as I talk to people, I always, you know, try to run my life experiences. And as a stand-up comedian, you know, uh, you, you get a lot of that. And it, it, as far as people who have a, maybe a mental health issue or mm -hmm. some kind of something, you know, I, I, I come from a, a rough family background, both poverty and some domestic violence stuff. And I know what, I'm relating with a lot of what you're saying. And I think that's a lot of reason why people turn to stand up comedy. The humor. Yeah. yeah. Cause the humor is such a powerful tool to mm -hmm. mask that. And then there's just also that, that euphoric reward of when you're, if you're good at comedy, you make people laugh and you, you, you right. have that, there's an addiction component there. It's yeah. an addicting feeling. And there's so many, you know, I, you know, not to use names, but so many people I who I know personally in comedy or and other people that, you know, major huge names who mm -hmm. have drug issues and things like that. Right. For what you're saying just makes so much sense whatsoever. I remember when I was in uh I, I was in kindergarten mm -hmm. and um I have a birthday in January. Okay. And when school started in September or whatever, when somebody had a birthday, the teacher put an inflatable birthday cake on their table and, <laughs> okay. and everybody sang to him and she played piano. And I remember the first time I saw that, I wanted to go home. I'm like, I don't want to do this. Right. That's, I don't want everybody look, you know? And so when, when my birthday came around, she put that, she put that thing on my desk and, um, I don't know why I did this, but I put it on my head, you know, <laughs> okay. just like what, and, and everybody laughed. And I like took it down real quick because I was like, oh, you know, it, it just start, it, it startled me. I didn't know I didn't know that was going to happen. Right. And uh, when I took it down, they stopped laughing. And I was like. And I put it back up there and they giggled a little <laughs> bit again and I put it back down. And uh, so I think that that's why, you know, I mean, that's just one of many reasons why humor was such a driving force in my high school and teen years um, was because uh you know, there were holes inside of me. Right. And just like you said, if I can make you laugh, if I can do this, I, you know, even if you're mentally healthy, it still feels great to make somebody laugh. And so, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, we're getting close to the end here and I got a few more questions I want to ask you, but what's first tell me you, you, when you described your, what I'm calling kind of the last solution that got you to the, the, the point of sobriety where you're at today, 
you had uh, this loving, caring woman, but you also had made the analogy of the whiteboard. Can yeah. you go through that again for the listener and tell me? What? That's why I thought that yeah. was really good. So, um, so like you just said, um, a huge reason why I was able to get to be sober was Taryn. Was somebody, a beautiful, loving, amazing, sweet person coming along beside me and showing me that I had value, that I wasn't icky, that I wasn't bad, and getting me, you know, pulling, literally pulling me up to where I felt like I wasn't just this terrible thing, right? But to stay sober is different, okay? Um, If you are just stopping drinking or doing drugs by simply putting the drugs and the drinks down, that's going to be difficult because you're doing drugs and you're drinking for a reason. Right. There's there's something that you're getting from that that is more powerful than the people around you telling you to stop. Right. That makes sense. Yes. So this is such a big deal for you and you're just going to put it down. That's going to be really hard. And it didn't work for me. And so um, when I, you know, looking back, as as I always do, why did I relapse? You know, I was doing so good. I felt so good. Well, anybody who hears this that knows anything about treatment or you've been there yourself or you know someone who has, you'll understand what, you, what I mean when I talk about the pink cloud. And the pink cloud is uh, kind of just a, you know, a goofy, fun term that we use when, when we're in treatment of just basically saying, I feel great. You know, I feel amazing. Because for 30 days, I haven't done anything really stupid. I haven't been arrested. I haven't let my kids down. I haven't made anybody cry. I, you know? For, I, I haven't stolen anything, and, um, and, it, and it just makes you feel really good. Right. But then what happens when you leave treatment, when you, just, when, you, when you float out of treatment on your pink cloud, when you're 30 years old, just because you didn't steal something or, 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 or screw somebody over, nobody's going to give you a pat on the back because that's expected, okay? Right. And um, so, so you start to... That, that pink cloud starts to uh, descend. And so I came up with this analogy that I think is, it, it fits exactly for me. And, um, you know, I'm just the average addict, so I'm sure this will make a lot of sense to a lot of other people. But when you're born, picture your soul or your conscience or whatever you want to call it as a perfect, just out of the package, never been touched whiteboard. It's perfectly white, okay? And every time you do something bad in your life, there's a little, you know, you take that dry erase marker and you make a dot on that whiteboard, okay? Right. Well, when you're living in addiction, especially when you're as deep as I was, homeless and all that stuff, literally every single thing you do in your life is a mark on that board, okay? So that thing starts to fill up, okay? And that's your soul. That's That that whiteboard is is, is the thing inside you that... that uh, that makes you you, okay? And it's all filled up with all this garbage, okay? And that weighs on you. And so when you come out of treatment and you're on this pink cloud, if you're not doing anything to stay on that pink cloud or if that descends and those dots that you made start to rise or if the pink cloud descends past those, all those black dots, you're going you're gonna to begin to feel the way you felt when you walked into treatment and you're not going to know why. You know, nothing changed. I haven't done anything wrong. I didn't use, I didn't steal, but why do I feel like I did when I walked in? Well, that's because you, you're still the person you were when you walked in. You just, you're, you're doing things differently. But now what, what has really helped me is to, uh, you can't erase those dots, right? right. On a real dry erase board, you can, but on your soul, those are going to be there. You will have always done those things. Okay. You can't change that. But what you can do is you can take a, a marker of a different color and you can paint over them. Okay. So let's say you stole $20 from somebody when you were, you know, using or whatever. I'm not saying you have to go give them $20. That's one thing you could do, but maybe you're in line at the supermarket and somebody's short $20 and you give them $20. Then you go to your whiteboard and you make a mark. And, you know, let's say you, you really let somebody down, you know, you just try to help people, I guess is what I'm saying. I'm, I'm getting a little stumbled over my words. But if you do that, the end result is going to be you're going to have this whiteboard that used to be almost black, covered, with, covered in black, and it's going to be a bunch of different pretty colors. It's going to be yellow and pink. And so you are going to feel better about yourself. You are not going to feel like you're bad. And 
The bonus of that is the people around you that didn't trust you when you came out of treatment, that, that, that didn't buy it, oh yeah, you're really fixed, buddy, okay, we'll see. Those people that question the, all that stuff around you, they're watching you make those marks on that black on uh, on that whiteboard too, and so the result of that is kind of uh, everybody heals. I heal, my family heals, my friends heals, all at the same time, and um, kind of helping them detox from their distrust. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. You're, you, I'm recovering from the drugs. They're recovering from me. What I did to them, how I made them feel, even if I didn't directly harm them or or take from them or hurt them, they still cared about me, and I was living a very reckless life. Right. And so they worried about me and spent time feeling all these negative thoughts because of me. And so now they need to heal from that too. And it takes time. You don't just, you know, you don't just rob banks for your whole life, go to prison, walk out prison, and you're just going to go get a job at U.S. Bank. Right. Nobody's going to hire you there. Definitely not U.S. Right? Bank. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. So it, it takes time. Exactly. That's good. All right. A couple more questions here. I think we'll be wrapping it up. So uh, one of the questions I asked you in the pre-interview um, was, what, what is your health now? What, what, was there any kind of physical damage done to you uh, from the extensive drug use? And you had a kind of an interesting story about yeah. that. Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Um, uh, if you would have asked me a month ago, I wouldn't have been able to answer that. Um, but, uh, you know, when you're out there, especially when you're shooting drugs into your arm and, and stuff like that, that's very reckless. And there's a lot of viruses and a lot of different things that, you know, you can catch from doing that. And, uh, you know, when you're in treatment, you get tested for that stuff. Um, but uh, I haven't been in treatment in three years, right? It's been a while. Right. And somebody had mentioned to me, but well, yeah, dude, but that stuff state, you know, that can, stuff can lay dormant in your system. So maybe you haven't used in three years. Maybe you got tested three years ago, and maybe six months ago that thing festered up, and now, and so that that scared me, right? Yeah. And so I called my doctor and I said, and I made this appointment to come in and get my blood tested, and I go to my appointment and I'm scared, right? I have anxiety to begin with, right? And right. then you add this on top of there, so I'm freaking out, and he's trying to calm me down, and this is a Thursday, and um. I said, okay, you know, Doc, I'll be fine. Uh, can I call you tomorrow and get the results? And he kind of cringed, and he's like, well, I, we're not going to know anything until Monday. He said, but but don't worry, okay? Just listen to me. I'm, you, you, you look healthy. You seem healthy. You just I promise you, if there's anything we need to talk about, I will personally call you on Monday morning. You understand? I said, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. I appreciate it. And so I leave. And uh, I tried not to worry about it all weekend, but I did. Right. And um, so I get to work on Monday, and I work at a mill. And so I leave my phone in my office, and my and uh, so I'm out doing my mill stuff. And I, I come in my office around like between eight and nine, and I look at my phone, and there's a missed call from my doctor. And um, I, I can't even I can't even explain how I felt. I felt, I mean. I got something. I don't know if it's Hep C. I don't know if it's AIDS. I don't know if it's both. Right. But I got something because he told me I'll call you if you know right. if I need to talk to you. And so I'm I'm trying to get a hold of him, but I can't. Right? He's a doctor. It's Monday. He's busy. His nurses are busy, so I can't get through to anybody for almost an hour and a half. And uh, finally, one of his nurses, I, I can get a hold of one of his nurses. And uh, you know, I, my voice was probably shaky. Hey, this is John Jewel. I, I had a missed call. She said, "Oh yeah, John. Uh, Doctor Intermezzo just wanted to call you and tell you himself that you that you're really healthy and you have nothing to worry about." Fantastic. And I was like, "Oh my goodness! Right? You could have opened with that, right?" <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good news. That's yeah. good. That's fantastic. Yeah. All right. So you you brought us through your story. Uh, it's it's a powerful story, and uh, you know, obviously, I'm it, I'm impressed. You know, I mean for you to be able to do this and you and you just stick to it and, and give where you are so you tell me now th three years sober now right mm -hmm. go going on three years so, I'll, I'll i'll be three years sober in um uh january i think so two i'm two and a half years sober right now okay somewhere in there hit about to hit the three year mark. yeah what what do you want to do relative to you know you're you're a recovering addict what are mm -hmm. you going to do with this besides do, tell me here on filter free america yeah and thank you for that i i appreciate that. I appreciate you. What what I want to do is um because like I said, you spend years building your addiction 
and then you go to treatment and in 30 days there's just no way that they can um that they can uh give you everything you need to to beat this you can't learn everything in 30 days um so what 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 i want to do is is i want to uh in like speech form or whatever because there's things that really helped me get to where i am that i didn't get there because they didn't have the time i'm not saying treatment centers didn't do their job they just didn't have the time to to give me the exact ingredients that i needed they gave me a lot but so what i want to do is um I would like to go and, you know, talk to young men I'm, I'm, I'm especially passionate about because like, like we talked about before, it's, it's really, it really hurts me to see men, young men in that situation when, um, you know, but women too, but I'm just not an expert on women, but, right. um, you know, I just want to help and I want to talk to them about purpose. I want to talk to them about that dry erase board. Um, you know, I want to, it's so easy to go to college. It, right. it really is. But but we don't we don't talk about that in treatment. We talk about twelve steps and we talk about this and that, which is great. But you know, there's just so many things that people can do to give their life meaning, purpose, passion, and to get behind. And um, we just have to have conversations like that. And so that's what I'd like to do. And um, you know, it starts here today. I'm I'm here today, able to talk about it, which I thank you so much for. Um, I, I love that you know because part of your story was using Craigslist. Uh, to, hey. to do scams. And then I found you on Craigslist Full wanting circle. to talk about the story, right? Full it's... circle, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I apologize if, uh, you know, I got choked up today. Like, like I said earlier, this is stuff I haven't thought about or talked about in years. But hopefully I'll be able to, uh, you know, perfect things a little bit and I'll be able to stay a little bit more composed in the future going forward because that's what I want to do. I, I want to uh, I want to be one of the reasons why... Why, why people are able to, to, to beat this thing because it's beatable and you can you can beat it and you can also have a fulfilling passionate life you but you have to have something that you're excited for when did we start talking on Wednesday was it Wednesday yeah Wednesday about that. Somewhere there. today's Sunday that's Wednesday Thursday Friday that's five days of excitement that I got right because this is step one of a how many ever step process for me but this is not this is the first step okay right so for five days, just because of a couple texts, but because I was on the track to something that I'm passionate about and want to do, I was excited and happy for five days. Nice. And so I just want other people to experience that and be able to understand that and to understand it and experience you'd have to you have to hear it. Right. Well, I, I appreciate it. I think I think I think it's brave of anyone because you know, I talk to a lot of people who tell me about bad stuff, mm-hmm. and there's a there's a degree of bravery to to open yourself up and don't apologize for the emotion. You know I, that the emotion is part of it. The emotion is the power. It's the same, you know, the tears, if you shed and things like that, I think that's, that's the energy, right. That, mm-hmm. That's getting to where you're at today. Yeah. And I think people need to appreciate that as when they listen to this and understand how real and how, how tangible mm-hmm. uh, that emotion is. So I thank you for doing this and I wish you the very best of luck. Thank you. Well, how'd you like that one? Was that a powerful episode? Was it everything that I promised you? An emotional roller coaster, right? Tense at times, uh, sad at times, happy at times, right? A little bit of everything uh, right here at the Filter Free America podcast. A big thank you uh, to Mr. John Jewell. Uh, very, um, very appreciative that, that he chose to share his story with me first. And, uh, you know, again, I, I say this often, but it's, 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 it's uh, impressive. That, uh, that people are willing to sit down and have a, a conversation with me and be as open, as honest as, as they are. Uh, this one being a no exception and quite honestly humbling. Um, we uh, here at the Filter Free America podcast uh, uh, wish John the very, very best. We, we want to make sure that he uh, maintains his, uh, his record of sobriety and uh, keeps fighting to stay clean. And I hope he gets to uh, do everything he wants to do. I hope he does get to be able to be a a uh, speaker to people who are at risk or in recovery or things like that because he's got a fantastic story to tell. He's lived the life. He knows how bad it could possibly get. And uh, how can you not learn something by listening to somebody who's gone through that kind of uh, that kind of battle with drugs? It's crazy. And uh, I guess on on a related note, I mean, we've had uh, 
a considerable amount of overdose deaths right here in the Twin Cities, and uh, heroin has uh, has uh, exploded again nationwide. So anybody listening to this, anybody who's uh, you know experimenting with uh, pharmaceutical drugs, especially opioids, uh, know that you know that addiction can set in to a point where you're jamming heroin into your body, and not everybody lives. Just as John said in the episode, and we described watching people die, having friends die of overdose, multiple friends die or associates die. And uh, like I said, you just need to turn on the news right now and look around the nation. The people are dying left and right. It's a, um, it's a powerful and, uh, and uh, disgusting drug. Lots of good people have died from it. Pretty sure some assholes have died from it too. But regardless, we don't want anybody to die from it. Don't don't do these drugs. Smoke some weed. Eat some mushrooms. Chill out. Don't do heroin. All right, guys. Let's uh, let's end on that. Uh, uh, thank you, guys. Thank you very much for listening to the show. Uh, make sure you uh, uh, make sure you spayed new to your pets and children. Make sure you keep seeking the truth. And I love you. Take care of yourselves. Don't do drugs. Talk to you next time here on Filter Free America. Bye-bye.